Welcome to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Every other week, we bring you Catholic teachings and stories of faith from people throughout the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. This is the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Gaudium et Spes podcast. Uh, If you haven't already, please check out our last podcast where we had the privilege of interviewing Monsignor Basso. Wow, what a great interview that was. Um, As you can see, I got my co-host Chez next to me here today. So Chez, how are you? I am well, Suzanne. I am uh, happy to be here. We did have a great interview with Monsignor Basso, a really, really cool conversation. Please check it out. A wealth of experience and education and all kinds of amazing service stories for our diocese. Um, So please do check that out. Absolutely. Mm, cool. Well, uh, we are back as usual. See how life is going with our Gaudium et Spes chapter one, paragraph one quote, which goes, the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. These are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. So my poor afflicted griefs, <laughs> not, not so... <laughs> I don't know what I was doing with that. (laughs) But how is your life going, Suzanne? Yeah, so it's going well so far. Great. You know, I think the thing that's been so wonderful about, you know, co-hosting with you here is all the incredible people that we've been able to meet so far throughout the diocese. And, you know, believe it or not, I've kind of kept in touch with a few of the people that, you know, really Really? um, personally impacted me, I think, a lot as we were, you know, kind of telling their stories and stuff. And so for those of you out there that um, I have kept in touch with, um, prayers go out to you and your families, and um, I will always continue to keep you in my thoughts and my prayers. So it's really been incredible, you know, just expanding your friend base and especially your spiritual friend base. I think we can all, you know, appreciate that. And um, that's something nice to have in our lives. You're so good about the intentionality stuff. You clearly, you clearly have a previous career in keeping up with people and knowing how to. Yeah, just uh, slightly. Yeah, maybe. just slightly. <laughs> That's amazing, though. No, you're right. I, it's, we, we're we're super blessed. Just I, I, when we were first th- thinking about starting this podcast, it was that was the most intriguing thing to me. It was like I just get to talk to interesting, cool people yes. who I wouldn't have probably been able to talk to otherwise. So, exactly. Um, yeah, I totally agree. A lot of highs just just in doing this with you. Mm-hmm. Personally, selfishly, my high recently, I got to sneak away for a 38-hour uh, guys weekend down Ooh. in Orlando with a couple of uh, one friend from who I've known gosh since fifth grade, um, and we went through high school and college together. Another one from from FSU. Got to do a golf day down in Orlando. We hadn't played golf in a while, but it was it was very enjoyable. Got rained on a ton, but oh man, it was <laughs> hit some good balls. Putted terribly, as you do when you don't play for a long time. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, But it was still something. It's one of those. It's like catnip. It was just like, you just like, (laughs) I don't need to play golf. And then you play once. I'm like, I need to be out there every week. Exactly. And then we rounded it off with an exhibition soccer game in Orlando between Arsenal and Chelsea with 65,000 of our best friends. And it was super fun. I hadn't been in a state. I I don't think it's one of those kind of COVID things where... You go to sporting events, and then you don't go because of COVID. And it's like, oh, this is what a sporting event is supposed to Absolutely. feel like. Absolutely, yeah. It, yeah, it was awesome. I don't know if you've been. Yeah, we actually just recently went up to Atlanta to see a Braves game. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, we had been to Turner Field to the old stadium, but mm. hadn't been to uh, the new ballpark. And, wow, it was just incredible. What a beautiful ballpark if you haven't been there yet. I mean, we're a huge baseball family, so um, this was uh, – a fun little trip that all four of us were able to make. That's really so, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Guys, we are starting a new series with Bishop today, and it's almost like Take Your Friends to Work podcast with Bishop, where he's going to take you into the ministry. His day-to-day life as a bishop today is part one, where he's going to talk about the overall just kind of mission he's received from the church on behalf of his people. And then part two will become in a, in a month's time where we'll talk about kind of his day-to-day. So sit back and relax, and we'll catch you on the other side. Hello, after presenting on the Bible for the last several episodes, and before that, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, I thought it would be good to talk about the ministry of the bishop, me. First, in the first part, I will talk about, you know, kind of the duties. What are the day-to-day duties and, and the overall duties of the bishop? And then make it more personal in the next episode, talking about what it is I do, with a, like a day in the life of the bishop. And also my experiences after having served as bishop for five years 
here in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee. So first, I'd just like to give a brief like overview of what it is that I do as a bishop. And this is important. You know, I think people immediately think, okay, the bishop, he's the shepherd. He's the overseer of the diocese. Yes, absolutely. But as a baptized member of the church, like everyone else, my first and foremost obligation, joy, privilege, is to witness to the presence of Christ in the world. And I don't just say that because I should. That really is, that's really the vocation for all of us, is to recognize Christ's presence, to adore the Lord, to make him known, loved, and served in the world. And that doesn't stop when one is ordained, but instead, of course, it continues in a very big way, and um, especially as a bishop as well. So that's really my first my first obligation, priority, is to witness to Christ's presence in the world. And that can happen in the way that I celebrate my faith or in the way I interact with people, in the way I treat people with love and respect, in the way I forgive and ask for forgiveness and things like that. I just, as I was thinking about this, I thought, wow, that's really, I, I need to start like that because I could just jump in and say, oh, the bishop is busy doing this, going to meetings, administrating, etc. But you know, at, at the heart for all of us of our faith is witnessing to Christ's presence and action in the world. So the bishop does that not only as a sign, but he truly is then Jesus Christ for the world, for the diocese, especially for this local church. Okay, now, so having said that, of course, the primary role of the bishop or with the, the, the image that is most familiar is that of a shepherd. The bishop is the shepherd, the overseer of the local church. And by the way, I'll use those terms synonymously, local church and diocese. The diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee is this local church here, and the bishop is the overseer, the shepherd of that local church. And it, this is for all people in the diocese, for all the parishes, all the ministries, um, all the institutions, all the activities of the church, all people, including those who are not of the faith. I'm the bishop for everyone who lives in this part of the Florida panhandle. Whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, I'm called to be the bishop for all of them. Obviously, for Catholics, that means that, that I assist them by um, administrating, administering the diocese and all of the functions in the diocese by uh, preaching and teaching and everything. But for those who are not of the faith, I think they can expect that I would also be the face of Christ for them in the way I treat them, in the way I reach out to them, in the way I try to build bridges and maybe even, and not maybe even, but work on ecumenism as well. So I am the, the overseer, the shepherd for the whole local church, for this whole diocese. For me, this means that I need to be as present as possible, physically even, all over the diocese. Now, it's a pretty broad, long diocese, and so um, there are, there's a lot of traveling to do, which is fine. That's great. You just have to get used to that in a place like this. Um, so I drive a lot. I don't have a driver. I don't have a priest secretary to drive me around. Um, it's just me, almost well, 99% of the time. And, um, and during those drives, I get to see the diocese. I can I can pray, I can listen to podcasts, um, I can prepare for my next homily or talk or something like that. But if you're going to be a bishop, uh, the bishop of the, a diocese like this, you have to get used to driving. And so I do that all over from here to Tallahassee regularly, but also down to Panama City, Crestview, Niceville, Port St. Joe, Apalachicola, Modest, Monticello, Madison, Perry, Pace, um, just all over the place, Navarre, Gulf Breeze, Panama City beach. Um, I already said that. Anyway, that's pretty much my life. I drive around a lot and I like it a lot. Now, here I was one day complaining to someone, not complaining, but I said, oh, I drive so much. It was at a bishop's conference. I just spent a lot of my time driving. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Where are you the bishop of? And he said, I am the bishop of Wyoming. And so uh, that bishop has to drive all over the place, the whole state. He's the one bishop in charge of the whole state. And so I shouldn't complain too much, but um, it is a lot of driving, and I, that's really important for me. It's important, and I'm learning that more and more over these five years, how important it is, and, and, and the fact that especially when something good or something tragic happens, I need to be there. 
I have not always done this in the past, and I apologize for that, but I, I'm learning that that's really important just to be there. For instance, right after a hurricane, you know, I, I was able to go in the Panama City area and just, just be with the people there and the priests there. Um, I'm finding that that's important, not just for those tragic and dramatic times, but, you know, all the time, as much as possible, I try to be present to people. Celebrating Mass with them or visiting each parish at least once a year. And usually, because of the confirmation schedule, I can do that. I can visit all the parishes, um, or most of the parishes, within a year. But some parishes, some of the missions, don't have confirmations every year, and so I have to really be careful and be attentive to scheduling a visit there as well. But that's really important. Also, not only physically present, I'm not only physically present. I try to be present as well in the form of this podcasts or videos or letters that I may write or other forms of communication to the parishioners, to the priests, to people, to school children, to people in the diocese. I try to be available as well to correspond via email and uh, letters and the phone in the office as well. So I'm just trying to be really present. The bishop should be present to the people. Now you say, of course, the bishop's going to be present to the people. That's that's why they're bishop. But in the old, old days, um, I don't know, in antiquity even, or just the early years of the church, the bishops were always out evangelizing or visiting brother bishops or encouraging others in, you know, just way off in missionary places. It got to the point, I think, even in the Middle Ages and later, where a law had to be made, a canon law had to be made. No, the bishop needs to be in his diocese for most of the time. Um, so now we take it for granted, but it is, it, that was not always the case. Before they thought, well, the bishop should be everywhere. He's kind of an ambassador. But, well, that's true sometimes. While I do need to be outside the diocese and be attentive to other communities, the vast majority of my time and any bishop's time should be spent in the diocese, being present to people. And not just physically, of course, but spiritually as well. Praying for the needs of the diocese, the needs of our priests, our deacons, our religious, our teachers, our principals, and indeed every parishioner and every person who lives in the boundaries. One thing that I do personally is when I conclude my day, I conclude on my knees praying for the diocese. And I imagine in my mind I, I picture the whole diocese. I start over at the state line at, of Alabama and, and uh, Florida, and then I just kind of I ask Mary's protection over the whole diocese, like stretching her, her mantle over the whole diocese, starting you know over here and at Holy Spirit Parish, way over there near near the state line, and you know Pensacola, Pace, Cantonment, and I just go all the way Crestview, Niceville. Go, you know, Mariana, Chipley, Bonifay, Tallahassee, all the way, and then down to Perry and up. And I, I do that in my mind, and I do that spiritually. I ask God to bless the whole diocese every night, especially those who are most in need, those who are most in need of God's healing touch or forgiveness or mercy or strength at that point. So know that if you are in the diocese, in this local church, you're being prayed over every night. The bishop is also to be the spiritual father for the priests. The priests at their ordination promise obedience and respect to the bishop. They work in communion with the bishop. They, the bishop is the overseer and the shepherd, first of all, of the priests. And so I take that very seriously. When we gather in our convocations or retreats, when we gather for liturgical celebrations, like the Chrism Mass, when we bless the oils and the priests renew their vows every year, or ordinations, or any other gatherings, I really try to impress upon them my love for them, the priests and the deacons especially, and also my care for them, my concern for them. I try to l let them know that I am always available. They have my cell number. They can contact me anytime. Um, and I try just to call them as well on their birthdays or just other special days or whenever I can. And I think that's really important as well. Again, these are things that I've been learning over the five years that I have served here. I also try to, to keep up with the priests by obviously visiting them, celebrating confirmations and other liturgies, but dedicating new altars, um, blessing, you know, groundbreaking ceremonies and things like that. Just try to be there as, as often as possible. And I try also to send the priests 
a video every three to four weeks, just um, kind of giving them an update as to where I am, giving them some things they may need to know, you know, just really keeping that, that connection going. Because again, since we are such a spread out diocese, it's important to keep in touch, especially in ways that are that make it seem a little smaller. Videos, podcasts, phone calls, etc. Overall, the, the bishop is responsible for the overall administration of the diocese. And at, that by that I mean everything, you know, um, the, the condition of the church buildings the health of the priests and the people the well i'm not really in charge of the health of all the people but that's that falls under my my care you know my concern um but uh, uh also just should we start a new parish should should we should we group these two parishes together what priests could serve at this parish um how are the schools doing how can we you know bring more students into our schools etc um, and as well, day to day, I am also responsible for the operations of the pastoral center, kind of you know where where we do where you have the finance offices and the tribunal offices, the school offices, Catholic charities, etc. So there's a lot of administrative work as well. Now the bishop can and should, and in my case, does. Um, uh, task other people to do that. We delegate a lot of that, those responsibilities to, say, the financial ones. I delegate to the uh, CFO of the diocese. Uh, a lot of issues in the school, I, de I delegate the superintendent to be in charge of that and take care of that. They may come to me and consult me or tell me that I need to make a decision on a certain level, but it's good also to um, delegate a lot of things like that. That's necessary. I am grateful that there are so many people who can do that so well. We have a chancellor here, Monsignor Mike Reed, and a vicar general, Monsignor Luke Hunt. They assist me as well. Presbyteral Council of Priests help me, the deans, and um, indeed all the priests do when I consult with them as well. And then just, it's kind of interesting, here in the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee, we have hired a new um, COO, that is a person who's in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the pastoral center. And uh, he will greatly assist me in my leadership, not only of the pastoral center, but of the diocese as well. And he's going to begin on August 15th. Now, the bishop is not just responsible for the diocese. Oh, yes, he is primarily responsible for that local church. But nonetheless, I'm also a bishop for the world is for the whole church and in communion with all of my brother bishops around the world. And so to that end, the bishop should attend various meetings on a state level or a regional level and certainly in the conference that is the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, and so I do that a couple times a year or retreat with other bishops. We try to build up that fraternity. Um, it's really difficult to to kind of get to know all the bishops. And you go to these meetings and you have 250 bishops there. It's really kind of hard to, you know, form a lot of friendships there. So, you know, during the year, or anytime it's possible, we try to get together in smaller groups just to share what, what we're going through, to pray for each other, to support each other, and also to socialize together and build up that brotherhood. That's also very important. The bishop is also, so teacher, administrator. The bishop is pastor. He's responsible for the pastoral functions, the, the, the care of the whole diocese, the whole local church. Um, so I do that primarily by celebrating confirmations, ordinations, as I said, the chrism mass, dedicating new altars or blessing new church buildings, etc., through masses and funerals and everything. Um, the priests primarily celebrate masses in the parishes in my name, and that's why they mention Francis our Pope and William our Bishop. It's really the bishop who is presiding over every mass, but since I can't be in all 50 churches and missions, the priests celebrate in my name. That's why they mention the bishop's name. It's really me. I'm celebrating the mass. I'm presiding, but they are celebrating it in my name. Um, I wish I could be at all the churches um, at once, but I haven't figured out how to do that yet. 
Um, I also wish I could do more hospital visits and prison and jail visits as well. That's, that's important for us to, to, to be with people in their time of need, those who are incarcerated, those who are sick, those who are dying or ill, to be with them. But again, I, and I can do that occasionally, but I do that mostly through the priests and the deacons who do that every day and lay people who do that so well. Same thing with college students and young adults and other groups you know, that meet, Bible study groups and everything, and young adult groups or adult study groups in the, in the parishes. I would love to do that. It, ultimately, it is my purview, but I can't be in every parish. So I, I'm grateful to all the people, the priests, deacons, lay people who do that in my name. You know, another thing that's really important, and um, it's always been important, but especially now, is media. You know, when Jesus said, go and preach, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he's basically saying, use whatever, can, you, you use your words, use your actions, that, that's media that you would go out to the, to the world to teach. Well, now we have videos and um, Twitter and Instagram and so many other ways, podcasts, so many other ways to promote the faith, to defend the faith, to teach the faith. And um, we're blessed to have this great studio to do things like this, this podcast, but also to um, reach out to the wider world, to be available to the local media and the national media when they have a question or when an issue comes up, to be able to, to meet with them and to be the face of the diocese and the church, to, um, to, to be able to answer their questions, to promote the faith, to, uh, to, like I said, to be, to be the, the, the face and the presence of Christ for the world. Now, again, most of my time, most of a bishop's time is spent in the diocese, and should be, and that's good. However, also, all of us bishops have an obligation to build up the wider church in our state, in our region, or maybe in the conference of the United States right now. And so... A lot of times we invite each other or other bishops to come and speak or give a retreat, a talk, or something like that. And I, I know people around me say that they, they don't think I say no. I say no to a lot of these things. But I also say yes. It's, it's really enjoyable to go to another diocese to speak to their priests. And they need to hear from a different person, I think, you know, in a different way. And so that's good. So I try to do that. I've got to balance it because there's a lot to do here. And I love to be here in the diocese and I want to be present. But I also enjoy, you know, going to, say, New Orleans. Or I'll go to Louisiana and speak to all their priests in a few weeks. Or to Colorado Springs or something. Or occasionally to um, Washington or other places to, to kind of build up the church in those places as well. There's great evidence that... Uh, my ancestors did this as well. Even in the Acts of the Apostles, we see the apostles going to different areas together and separately and building them up. Or we see bishops like St. Ignatius of Antioch or Polycarp, and they visit each other's churches and they, they kind of have little bishop swaps, you know, or something. All right, that's not found in the writings. I just made that up. But anyway, um, that's what they have been doing, and that's what we do even today. Now, that's going to be the one thing you're going to remember is bishop swap. Or again, that's, that's not an official term. I just made that up. Um, and then also, of course, all of us deal with office work. Um, and it can be a drudgery, especially for someone like me, someone who likes to be out with the people and everything. But nonetheless, I've come to see that that's really important. We need people to be in the office. We need good administrators. Um, we need people to be available to answer questions or to receive complaints, or just to be a sounding board for people. And that's what I try to do as well. So I spend a lot of my time during the day in my office at the Pastoral Center when I'm not traveling around the diocese or outside. I, I think it is important for anyone in leadership, and especially and including bishops, to spend a lot of time discerning, praying, thinking about where the Holy Spirit is leading us for the future. And I say, I think we should. Unfortunately, I know a lot of us don't because we deal with the day-to-day -day concerns like, like you do, like, like a parent would at home, like, like anyone would to deal with the, the things that come up, like a homeowner, you know, you deal with, oh, we, you didn't plan on this, but now there's a, a leak in the roof and now you have to attend to that. And all your attention goes toward that for a few days or, or even longer. Same thing with my work as well. 
I'd like to be able to spend more time discerning, praying, thinking, planning for the future, you know, putting together maybe a strategic plan for our diocese. And hopefully that will happen now that we are hiring a new COO. Um, I think that'll, that'll help make that process a little bit uh, easier for me to do that. Um, also, I was just kind of thinking of one thing that's important for us. I talked about, you know, going to different dioceses, helping, giving talks and retreats. But it's also important that we serve on various committees. Um, a lot of us kind of complain that we're asked to be on a lot of committees, but that's important. You know, we have so many committees in the church and in, at, in the level of the U.S. CCB, that is the Conference of Catholic Bishops, that are really important. You know, a committee on uh, worship, a committee on doctrine, a committee on uh, the protection of the unborn, a, a committee on um, young people, young adults, etc. And um, a lot of us, all of us, serve on one or two or five committees. And so that means that we travel a lot. Thankfully, now we can do a lot of our meetings via um, video conferencing, so that's good. But that's really important as well. You know, at my sometimes when I'm a little overwhelmed with traveling and doing things outside the diocese, I think, you know what, I was, I was ordained just to serve these people here at this church. I'm just going to stay here. But that's not really true. Um, all bishops are ordained to serve the entire church, particularly this local church, this particular church. Okay. And like I said, at, in the next episode, I'll talk a little bit more about kind of the day, of, a day in the life of the bishop and, and what I have learned over the last five years. Some of the things that, um, yeah, all the things that I've learned and, and I'd like to share that with you. But just quickly, people ask me, I'll, I'll tell you now, you know, Aside from all those things that you mentioned, from traveling or being present or celebrating confirmations or you know, dedicating new altars, things like that, what do you like to do when you have free time? I'll do a little bit more of that next time, but I like to be at home. I like to unwind by with uh, reading, doing crossword puzzles, sleeping in on my day off. I do take Mondays as my day off most of the time. It doesn't always work out, especially if I'm traveling. But I like to sleep in. I like to relax at home, read, you know, do a lot of praying. Of course, I have a little chapel in the house, so I get to spend a lot of time there praying with the Lord. Um, and um, it's just good to just relax and unwind and uh, get ready for the next day. There is a lot more that I will share with you, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of what the bishop is called to do. And there are more things that I've missed, but I'll, I'll mention them next week and I'll make it more personal. But um, this is what uh, our church teaches that, that the bishops uh, are to do. This is why we're ordained, so that we can be teachers, administrators, and pastors primarily, that we can be fathers, spiritual fathers for the priests, that we can promote the faith, teach the faith, defend the faith, not just for Catholics in the diocese, but for non-Catholics as well, for all citizens, and then to be the face of the church for the wider world via media and um, giving talks or just being available whenever asked to do things like that. There you go. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I look forward to sharing a little bit more personally in the next episode about my experiences as a bishop so far. Hello and uh, welcome back. Wow. Um, you know, what an incredible responsibility that our bishop has um, within our diocese and throughout the world, really. Um, Chaz, I think he, really, he did a really great job at the very end and kind of summarizing in four key bullet points, you know, the things that he is responsible for as the bishop. Um, first of all, he talked about what the bishop is called to do. Secondly, he mentioned the fact that he is the spiritual father to all of our priests within the diocese, that he is called to defend the faith, and finally, to be the face of the church um, for the entire world. And so that's just an incredible... It's a big you know, It is, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how he does it each and every day, but you know, you've got the privilege of working here at the Pastoral Center, so you've got... The, you know, the opportunity to meet with him, to talk with him one-on-one, -on -one, to be in meetings with him, to see him out and about. And so, you know, what are, what are some of the things that have impacted you the most about his roles and responsibilities? Well, I, I can't help but start 
with just the singular uniqueness of our bishop, um, just as far as a, as a person, as, as a personality. Um, if you only just listen to these podcasts, you just you get a glimpse of how dynamic and interesting he is and stuff like that. So that's the first, when you ask me that question, first thing that comes to mind, bishop is cool. <laughs> yes. I enjoy hanging out with him. Uh, but I will say, getting to work with him, so this is a, a kind of, as a, as a cradle Catholic, when I thought of who's... Who's my leader as a Catholic? The first person you think of usually, I think, is Pope. Absolutely. Right? Yes. So a bishop, but he's mm-hmm. the Pope, right? And if I thought of my second, especially if I was a kid or, you know, younger, it would have been like, who's who's the other person who's a priest? Yes. And there's somewhere in between where the bishop is just that guy, especially as a teenager, who comes and does confirmation. <laughs> um and I knew I mean I had, you know, I had gotten a good education and, and kind of gotten more versed in what the documents say, what the mm-hmm. history of the church says, but I'd still never really worked or spent time around a bishop till I got here to the pastoral center. And like I said, you get into meetings and you get a sense of, first of all, the word, when you think of the word parochial, it comes from the uh, associated with parish, kind of like limited thinking. Right. And it's true. It's kind of like you grow up as a Catholic and your Catholic world is your parish mm-hmm. and that's kind of it. You get meetings with Bishop, and he's just in our diocese. When we're proposing an idea or talking through something, he's got to think about 50 parishes. Right. Um, he's got to think about pulling one lever here with one priest in terms of a move or something like that. Starts this domino effect mm-hmm. that goes across and affects the entire presbyterate and all these different parishes and stuff. And you see kind of from a macro level how difficult and how, how strategic you have to be as a governor. Um, of this local church because right. it is this apparatus which has a lot of moving parts and um, and the church in her wisdom Christ in his wisdom has entrusted it to a singular person not to a council of it's not a board of um, directors like right. at a company or something like that um, and it's something that given the law of our church it does finally rest on his he, he talked about in the podcast he delegates a lot of things yes but He's not able to delegate everything. Like by law, he can't delegate everything. So you kind of get a sense for the the difficulty of the the complexity of the whole thing, and then also kind of how it does. Not by his own. He didn't like sign up and be like, "I want everything to be my responsibility." Mm-hmm. But it's always been this way. It falls on his shoulders in so many different ways, and you get a sense. Oh, we need to pray for this man. Oh, this man, you know, has you got to be an expert. We talked about last time with Monsignor Basso how mm-hmm. much we expect a priest. Even more is expected of bishops um, in terms of their ability to not just be great homilists and speakers and public ribbon cutters and stuff like that, but governors and um, strategic thinkers. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned just keeping up with his priests and calling them on their birthday. There's 60, 70 priests he has to do that with. So human resource managers, it is so, so vast of, of a set of responsibilities. So. That was a long-winded way of saying, <laughs> basically, I've gotten a sense for how big our diocese is, even though it's small. Right. <laughs> um, how big it is and how much care it takes to kind of hit on all the things you need to hit on. So yeah. that's initial takeaways. I don't, I don't, I don't know if that was... I, yeah. I think that was pretty comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I would just like to, you know, just say that I think we are blessed with an incredible bishop here. Yeah. Um, bishop Bill has been amazing in his entire tenure. I think he has made a profound impact, but I think he doesn't do it alone. I think there's a lot of people behind the scenes that help to make it happen. And, you know, he talked about his, um, you know, appreciation of all of our lay people out there that are doing a lot of the things that he wants to say yes to that he can't because he does have so many obligations. And so thank you to all of you out there that do so much for our diocese day in and day out. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Bishop Walk, for everything that you do. Um, and uh, I'm excited because at the next podcast, um, he'll kind of go over a day in the life of a bishop. So we'll see what he does when he first wakes up in the morning and when he goes to bed at night. Guys, this is, you don't <laughs> want to miss this. It's going to get hilarious at some point in time. I don't know. I mean, we get to see a lot of it and stuff like that. One of the most enjoyable things here at the Pastoral Center is um, when I walk into the break room sometimes and I see his bike. Yeah. <laughs> next to the recycling. And right. I'm like, it's just some one of the quirky things about our bitch. I'd imagine just waking up, doing more prayer, hopping on his bike. And like somebody just walks, driving down the road, just like, who is that guy? It's like, right. That's the bishop of the diocese. He's just riding his bike to work. Like exactly. a, your average Joe. Um, an amazing thing. So yeah, do not miss it. It's going to be awesome. We'll see you back here though in two weeks time for another 
I mean, don't miss any of our podcasts, but especially these next two. Uh, we're going to sit down with a pre and Father Justin Fedden, who are two gentlemen from Joseph House in Tallahassee. Yes. And you get to hear about a man's journey through the, the um, criminal justice system, incarceration, and also kind of rehabilitation, redemption through an amazing apostolate in our diocese, which you may or may not have heard of called Joseph House in Tallahassee. Please don't miss this really cool uh, encounter uh, with a living face of Christ in our own diocese. So we'll see you then. Thank you for tuning in today to the Gaudium et Spes podcast. If you would like to know more about our podcast, please visit gaudiumetspes.net or go to ptdiocese.org and click the button that says podcast. If you listen to the audio version from an app such as iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify, be sure and rate, review, and comment. If you watched us on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe or leave us a comment there as well. Thank you for joining us.